Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone doing? We've got, we got a thumbs up, We're doing well. Perfect. Excellent. Very glad. I hope those that are staying up late in Singapore are also doing well. Uh, those that are uh, online uh, are enjoying the content. We are at our final session for today uh, and for the conference uh, in totality, um, but by no least, uh, by no means the least important. It's come up a little bit already throughout the conference, uh, sustainability, in high, uh, sustainability within higher education. It was brought up recently in the mobility panel, um, uh, very uh, lightly, but we wanted to ensure, particularly with the release of last year's QS sustainability rankings, that we put the debate and discussion, rather, uh, of sustainability front and center on the main stage. To undertake this, we have a fireside chat, which will be led by Brendan O'Malley, Editor-in-Chief at University World News. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you, and uh, I'd like to, to welcome our, our uh, distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Brian McCra, who is uh, a senior advisor to the uh, president of, uh, uh, on European initiatives of Arizona State University, often cited as one of the most innovative universities in the United States. Um, but he was also for 10 years uh, the president of Dublin City University here in Dublin. And he's a distinguished researcher in, in uh, many areas, including biomedical diagnostics and a member of the Royal Irish Academy, which is perhaps one of the highest honors you can get uh, in, in Ireland, uh, in academia. And he also has very practical experience having led national reviews of medical training and STEM education, not to mention chairing the COVID-19 vaccination task force in Ireland. So we're very lucky to have you here, uh, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so here, we're, I'm told this is, this is billed as a, a fireside chat on sustainability, which did make me wonder. It's kind of a metaphor for our age that uh, we certainly talk about climate change, but we're still fanning the flames of global warming. And uh, but against that, it's certainly um, not the case that universities are doing nothing about it. There are many universities around the world that are doing um, a great deal. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you, why do you think that those universities that are taking the lead are making it uh, a priority to address sustainability? Thanks very much, Brendan. Uh, I'm delighted to, to be here, and uh, thanks to everybody for, for staying the course to the final gra graveyard fireside chat session. Um, so why should universities be engaged with the challenges of sustainability? Well, I think it comes back to that age-old question for universities. What are universities for? And I think, um, you know, that's the, I think it was Stefan uh, Collini posed that in, in his book. Um, I believe that universities were established for the common good. Uh, they have the privilege of both creating and disseminating knowledge, but they also have the privilege and responsibility of nurturing informed ethical citizens who can bring value to society. Now, and, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing the words of many people in, in all of that. But those two things together, when, when faced with a, a potential, a real global uh, catastrophe in the we used to be able to say it many decades ahead, but it's not many decades ahead, it's, it's imminent. Um, I think the, the role of universities becomes very obvious and becomes very, very critical. I mean, the world is on fire, are universities going to stand and look at it and just describe it? No, of course they're not. And more and more universities are taking this uh, extremely, extremely seriously. The key word in all of this is urgency. Uh, I mean, extreme temperatures, extreme weather events, uh, sea level rises. I, I, in preparing for this, I, I got, uh, I read something just in the past 48 hours that when we talk about sea level rises, for example, we think, well, if we slow down uh, carbon emissions, um, that will help. In fact, sea levels will continue to rise for hundreds of years. So the, 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 what's already in the atmosphere is gonna make this happen. And if you look at islands, if you look at cities, Dublin being one of them that are on the sea. Look at them in 50 years and see what the predictions are from something that cannot be stopped now. Right? So for all of these reasons, I think universities have a, I, I would call it a moral responsibility to be
be that agent of transformation in society. And I'd, I'd, I'd name three things they, they, in terms of educating, inspiring, and informing the future leaders and change makers. And these are people who have to make changes in the next 20 years. You're not talking centuries ahead. They have to um, influence governments, influence society in terms, by, by their example and by their knowledge, in terms of that transformation, behavioral change that has to happen. And lastly, they need to create knowledge that will tackle the issues in terms of creating knowledge that feeds innovation that can cause the changes at scale and at speed. It's not just incremental, it has to be at scale and at speed. So for all those reasons, I think universities have a, a pivotal central role to play. And I think many, many universities around the world have, have taken on that mantle. And I think you see it in the rankings here, you see it in the rankings in other parts of the world as well, that, that they're now taking it very, very seriously. I suppose the question one has to ask about rankings is whether um, this sort of thing is about uh, labelling what you, what you are already do in terms of achieving uh, or, or contributing towards sustainability or whether it actually motivates you to do more. And what we're seeing uh, is, is much greater uh, movement or a sense of uh, certainly advocacy for universities to be taking a much uh, deeper role in uh, both in combating climate change but in achieving sustainability more broadly. And we saw this at the, uh, the World Higher Education uh, Conference last year in Barcelona where um, universities' role as a vehicle of transformation of society and their purpose being to transform society was right across the agenda and that really was what people were saying universities should now be about. So there seems to be a kind of um, a sort of sea change in, in thinking that's emerging um, it may not be reflected in the traditional rankings, it may be reflected a bit in the new rankings, on, in the impact rankings and on the sustainability rankings that QS has brought out recently. Um, but uh, uh, there seems to be other pressures pushing this change and one of them we're hearing a lot about uh, is, is, is uh, the pressures coming from students. But in your opinion, what, where, where is the drive for change coming from? I think there are many drivers of change, and I think I'm glad you mentioned students. I would start with students, because I think students started ahead of us in this, and they're still ahead of us. And certainly in my experience, both at Dublin City University and at, at ASU, students um, really are, are hugely motivated by this. I first noticed this trend in, in my final five years of my decade in charge of DCU. This was 20, 2010 to 2020, but in the final five years of that, students were voting with their feet in terms of where they would go for employment because they were values driven. And they knew the, the employers that were, were really about equality, diversity and inclusion, for example, and they could tell you. And employers would tell it to us as well that you know, how, how do we actually make ourselves more real. But now that focus on values has now transitioned on to sustainability values and you know, what, what are the, the true credentials of employers. But I think students now asking about universities, what are your credentials uh, in the university? I remember when we started a, uh, a, a, the concept of a plastic-free campus in, in DCU, the students were to the fore in that as well. An example from the um, University of Glasgow, who are really strong in this area, but when they set themselves a, a zero carbon target of 2035, the students and the staff, in fact, went to the DC and said, no, we need to, bring, we need to be more ambitious, 2030. So students cer certainly, and I think, it's an important issue for universities to consider in the future certification or, or, or indeed perhaps accreditation that truly calls out this because students will want to know. But I think staff as well, staff are highly motivated by, by this. University leaders that I talk to around the world uh, are all getting more and more motivated. Some not sure what to do and, and seeking assistance. Uh, governments are starting to get involved as well in, in a big way. And I noticed recently the French government gave a set of very strong directives to French higher education institutions in terms of not only introducing new degree programs that would reflect sustainability principles, but ensuring that they were instilled right across all disciplines, uh, ensuring that the strategies of the institutions reflected this as well. So I think there are many drivers out there. Uh, you, governments have the opportunity through the compacts and the contracts for performance that exists in many countries, including Ireland, to, to, if you like, add some leverage in there as well in, in, and to connect government policies with university actions and university strategies. So many drivers, but I said start with the students because they're, they're the people that in the next two to three decades have to make this difference and they know it.
Yes, but uh, in, it's interesting what you're saying about governments, though, because of the French have sort of more influence over their universities, perhaps as a government, than uh, because of the system they have than than than, than in other countries. Uh, so. Uh, are there examples of other countries that are taking a lead in creating the right uh, levers, the right uh, for, for changing universities as a government? Um, the best example, the, 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 the best example closer to home would be the European Union itself. And the, many in the audience would know that the European Union strategy around higher education is around these European university alliances, mm -hmm. and in certainly in terms of the kind of the challenge-based education to the are at, at the core of those as well and a number of the alliances themselves are aligned explicitly with sustainability principles as well but if you go there's two issues driving strategy in Europe um, the the green deal for the green transition and the uh, digital transformation they're, they're the two main issues and that's reflected in what they're saying about higher education and the key role it has to play. So, the, for example, the European Universities Association has come up with very, some very strong engagements with the Green Deal at European level and, the, and highlighting the critical role that universities can play. So um, you contrast this with the US, which I think is what you're saying, where governments don't actually get involved in driving policies with universities and it's much more the local, the autonomy of the universities themselves. And um, I think we're, we're seeing more and more universities and more prominent universities like ASU taking this so, so seriously. Um, I don't know about the QS rankings for sustainability, but I looked recently at the Times Higher Education rankings. And if you look at a map of the world, mm. this is sustainability rankings, Africa was, it was very clear that many countries were hardly submitting anything from their universities. And that, there's lots, um, there's lots to be uh, inferred from that and lots of work to be done between the global north and global south in that regard in terms of partnership with universities. Going back to what you're saying about Europe is interesting because the, uh, the European Universities Initiative is a great experiment in a way in sort of uh, um, making much more fluid uh, um, the possibilities within higher education, for instance, having... Uh, degrees where you do different parts of your degree in different universities in different countries within the same alliance. Uh, and uh, very much in the discussion about uh, uh, dealing with global challenges through the uh, Agenda 2030, um, um, there is a great sense that there has to be transdisciplinar transdisciplinarity, what I would struggle to say, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, a different approach almost to education. But I think we'll come back to that um, a bit later. But first of all, let's just go into a bit more detail about what we actually mean by sustainability and what we mean by practices, because sustainability isn't just about having a green campus, um, you know, zero carbon emissions. Uh, sustainability, uh, as, as has been agreed internationally, is about this much broader agenda of tackling inequalities, uh, peace and justice, uh, you know, poverty, hunger, all the challenges addressed by the United Nations sustainability um, goals which are part of what they call Agenda 2030, which was agreed by all the governments, or virtually all the governments yes. of the world. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that gives a buy-in to a reason for, university, uh, for governments to also think about the role of higher education. And there's often a complaint that they don't think enough about the contribution that higher education uh, has to make and will make to uh, transforming the world. Uh, so could you tell me a bit about what, what, what does it mean uh, you know, sustain, sustainability practices in your view? Yeah, as you suggested, Brendan, that there are many different frameworks one can use to look at sustainability in the context of universities. And you've got the, the, the 17 SDGs as one framework. Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland and heavily involved in the climate justice. She would say climate justice is the framework. Others would say donut economics and the planetary boundaries. Um, what we have been doing uh, at, at uh, ASU is one of the roles I have there is part of what's called the University Design Institute, the UDI, which works with universities around the world in terms of transformation, assisting them with transformation, and, and are getting more and more calls for uh, diagnostic clinics to assist universities in transforming towards sustainability. And we've identified six headings for universities in terms of you know, a whole of institution approach to this, and that would be the obvious ones of teaching and learning, research and innovation, Thought leadership, where you're influencing policy regionally and nationally, for example, and internationally. Engagement both within the university, but also 
a civic engagement and industry engagement being a critical part of, of integrating universities and change. Student empowerment, so leveraging the student voice, the student energy, the student insights. And finally, the university operations and services so that universities themselves should be, if we want change in society, the universities should be exemplary institutions and showing the way uh, in, through their thought, thought leadership, but in how do they do their own business and, and all the obvious things in terms of uh, a carbon footprint, waste, water, um, emissions, all, all, of, all of these issues that are, that are part of the operations themselves. And th they're not always easy, but they're, they're the six headings we've used to frame this. And if a university is truly committed to sustainability, it'll be reflected in all of those. And there are some very good exemplars from, our, uh, exemplars from around the world in terms of what universities are doing in each of those areas. Some affect the students, some affect society, some expect, affect just the environment itself, just the environment. So. And, and in terms of, uh, you, you were talking about campus operations, but of course, campus operations is not just, again, it's not just about the uh, 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 climate action, it's also about addressing all of the monopoly of sustainable uh, development goals. So for instance, as a massive local employer in many places, a university has a, a duty to think about who is it employing, under what terms, how are they employing, exactly. what yeah. materials are they using, where are they bringing it from, are they using locally based materials, what are they, the environmental cost of, of the whole uh, supply system for the university? Of course, and the procurement, uh, it's green procurement is a key, a key issue, um, but as you say, the, 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 sometimes people argue about the breadth of the SDGs, the 17 of them, and it cover almost everything, but, but they're very good, and particularly when you, when you dig down into what meant by each of them, uh, the sub-clauses in them, in terms of the performance, behaviour, and the culture of a university, in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, access to education, um, all of these issues, it's a very good framework for actually for, for the culture one creates in a university. One of the big drivers, or well they say, you know, what's very important is SDG 4, which is the education, uh, you know, a high quality education, lifelong learning, uh, which includes arguably higher education and, and should more, more, more uh, specifically, I feel, include it. Uh, 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 there's a bit of a weakness that it's not actually specifically mentioned, but clearly it's a driver of nearly all the other all the other goals can't be achieved unless uh, you're doing well in SDG 4 in, in providing a high quality education at all levels to all population, diverse population, not simply... No, I think, I, I think you're right. And it, it, I mean, I think the key issue there is that the interconnectedness of all of these, you know, the, the, there's not one thing, whether you look at food, you look at poverty, you, you, you look at education, they're all interconnected. And I think that's why it's in Mary Robbins would, would, would promote this notion of using the climate justice framework. And then if you, it's a highly motivating framework to use in terms of a, a social justice a, approach to this and the global north, global south, the gender aspects of this, how young women and girls around the world are suffering disproportionately in this and so on. But I think, um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think the interconnectedness and complexity of all of this comes back to an earlier point you made, and that is that you can't tackle this in universities in a disciplinary fashion. Because no single discipline can tackle any of this. Every single issue one looks at requires that one focuses on this in a multidisciplinary way. And certainly I, I've come, as you mentioned, from a STEM background, uh, um, but I think all the arguments about STEM versus arts, humanities, social sciences disappears in all of this because AHSS is hugely important here. In fact, some people would argue that we now know the science that, that are, is behind all the problems that we have to deal with and maybe innovation will not be quick enough to come up with new solutions, but be, human behaviour, behavioural science becomes a, a massive issue. That we, we need now to bring society with us over the next short number of decades to affect change or indeed, and it's very rarely mentioned, climate adaptation to adapt to the inevitable changes, the ones that are hardwired in already. It was, it was interesting, it was, we were having a chat earlier about, about uh, uh, turf, the use of turf for fires in Ireland. You know, when I, when I grew up, I used to come to Ireland every summer and, um, and we used to love the smell of turf uh, in, the, in, the, in the arger in the cottage. You know, and uh, and we knew we were, we knew we were in the West once we could smell it. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yeah. but, and 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 one of our technicians was telling us how uh, uh, you know in the West it's it's very difficult. People still still want to keep using 
stuff because they've always used it. Why should they? Th they're suddenly saying what they've been doing for a thousand years is causing a problem. But that, that gets to the root of it, that it's not just about uh, the science. And this is kind of a Western um, problem, really, that we tend to think that you can solve everything by making something, designing something. No. But we don't tend to think enough about how you've got to bring yeah, yeah, people yeah. with you. No, no, I think that's uh, right. Absolutely right. I'm, as I say, behavioural science in particular, and I know, I know a lot of... Um, <laughs> institutions around the world, including in Ireland, are looking, the ESRI here doing fantastic work looking at this, but we have to bring society with us. And, and it comes back to what I said about those six pillars of what universities do, but civic engagement, engagement with societies and communities around the universities, informing, educating, bringing people with us, I, I think is going to be crucial. Well, civic engagement has uh, uh, two sides to it, the civic engagement and the sort of public engagement. So there's on the one hand, there's the civic engagement where when you're doing your research are you doing the uh, are you are you are you going out and connecting with the people you're trying to help are you learning from them what they their view of what they need uh, are you co-designing the solutions are you following up and seeing uh, you know what problems they came across when they tried to implement them uh, um, you know which is a, a different approach than the past the old-fashioned approach of the, the researcher knows best they go in design a solution do it and then they never have to come back again, you know. So uh, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is public engagement, though. And we pro perhaps something we don't hear enough of, but we really need to hear um, the voice of academic experts, uh, much derided by some populists, but very necessary, uh, in, in telling us and trying to win over hearts and minds about what needs to be done and why certain measures need to be taken. Where perhaps, you know, we've kind of lost some guiding influences. In, in the past, we had, you know, the church, which is quite discredited in a number of countries these days, uh, and politicians seem to be particularly discredited at the moment because they're always... Apart from the, the speaker that we have coming after us here. Yes, apart from that. <laughs> there's, there's a particular problem with populism and, and the sort of extremes and polarisation that people are, are, are just listening to politicians as their tribe rather than reasoned argument. Uh, we're seeing that in the States particularly... No, I think, I think you're right, and it, it goes back to your, your very first question to me, why universities why university should be involved? And although there are exceptions, and the US is going through some difficult situations at the moment in this regard, but universities are generally trusted institutions. Mm. It depends on their behaviour. Any organisation can lose that trust, as we're hearing in Ireland at the moment. But, uh, but universities, in the main, are trusted institutions. And uh, you, you mentioned my work on the, the, the vaccination task force for COVID-19 here. University academics from a broad range of universities play the critical role there. So, so we hit almost 97% of adult, adults in Ireland got fully vaccinated in the, in the initial phase of vaccination. Mm -hmm. Incredible figures, which we, we couldn't have predicted. But part of that was, it was, again, was bringing society with us. And there were many factors, but certainly the trusted voices of clinicians and academics and lots of the Irish people in the audience would know the people I'm talking about right across GCU, Trinity, UCC, UCD. They played an important role through media and people listened. People listened, they came forward, they understood and it was not just talking about the science, it was explaining it in an accessible fashion, making it rational. And I think that helped. And I think the same applies here in that, again, reinforcing that role of the university of, if you like, mediating, being the mediator in the middle of the complex data and it's a complex situation but translating that into language that's understood by people and as a result having that collective action that needs to happen if we're to actually effect change at sufficient rate to avoid the, the cat catastrophe that's facing us all. So to make universities real <coughs> engines of change, for them to reframe their mission in line with the, the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs um, and, and, to, and to change how they provide education to give that experiential learning that transdisciplinary approach both in learning and research I mean how do you go about that as a university leader what what advice would you give to them you know they say look okay well right we're behind this agenda what on earth are we to do it seems like a gargantuan project well <coughs> I'd be careful about me giving advice to other leaders but uh, if asked I, I would politely say well look what we've learned I mean part of that work we're doing at ASU is, is coming up with solutions a kind of a solutions playbook for universities that takes account of their context and the one thing any university leader would tell you is, you know, resources, resources, resources are such a big problem. And that some of this is not cheap. And you have to prioritize. And that prioritizing means, prioritizing some things means deprioritizing others. 
But it is about looking at that, what I would call moral responsibility of universities and actually focusing on those issues that you absolutely need, need to be done. As, come back to the fact that the, the people who are going to make this happen are the students that are currently in our system. That's a kind of a shocking thought, and that, that, that might be at the, uh, the higher end of secondary schools and high schools now, and in university. They're the people that are going to make the difference, and that's what puts a huge onus on universities to do this. I, I heard a very good analogy recently when John F. Kennedy, who's been celebrated in Ireland this week, made the moonshot target. He talked to people then, um, and I think it was less than 20 years later, they, they landed on the moon, right? The average age of the people involved in the landing on the moon was 28, right? So, so there were people who were at, at high school when he made that speech, and then between that time and when it happened, they were the people that came through the education system. We're in a very similar situation here, so universities have that role of getting that curricular piece right. That's difficult. It is challenging for universities to do it, but there, there, there are good examples out there. Um, if I can mention one from close to home here, UCC, University College Cork, who have been very strong in Ireland in this sustainability space over recent decades. They developed a, a, a campus-wide module on sustainability for students, for staff, for the broader community. Um, it's called Putting Sustainability in Its Place, Putting Yourself in the Picture. And they have staff from 15 disciplines de uh, deliver it, as, as well as people from their estates and buildings office. But again, creating that message of the role you play, understanding sustainability and the role each individual can play in, in it. But there, there is a, another example is, take one from the Global South, Asheshi University in Ghana. What they did was they brought in, a, they hired two or three climate scientists for a period of time and they went through every single degree module and, and, and program course and they assessed it for the accuracy of how they had in, uh, integrated concepts of climate change and climate crisis in there. That's very innovative, but it means every student coming through um, will understand whether they're in business, whether they're in, in tech, whether they're in science, whether they're in the humanities, understands at least at a, at a high level the, the issues that are involved and importantly the role they can play. So is, is it about having, uh, so, so is it about, I mean, Education for sustainable development, which is a key part of this. Yes. <coughs> Creating the young change makers of the future. Is that something that needs to be compulsory, a compulsory part of the curriculum? Is it about rewriting every single, you know, the curriculum in each department, or is it about having something extra, or is it about being optional? What's it, what is the best way? I think, I think one would have to uh, accept there are different ways of doing it, and would have to ex accept the kind of resource constraints for different people, but there are some a, a very, very interesting innovations that have come through in recent years, and I've, we, we're in dialogue with two companies at the moment, uh, both from Europe, one from the Netherlands and one from France, one called uh, Sulitest, who have developed a, a certification assessment of the knowledge of students around uh, sustainability principles. And, and their, their concept is you, you measure in first year, your first year students, what their baseline knowledge is. And then you can measure different stages along the program itself. You see what the university is doing right across different degree programs to bring that knowledge forward. That's, that, that's one of them. Um, Educ is this uh, a lady, Joanna Wagner from, from the Netherlands, she's developed this uh, which looks at course content and evaluates that but works with institutions and again coming up with a certification in this. Um, I just think we have to look at a range of innovations that, but th that ensure the students are coming out with, with this awareness. There is another driver, this is what we didn't talk about and uh, I'm not sure if it's come up th at the conference so far, that's green skills. Mm -hmm. There was an extremely interesting report just launched by LinkedIn just a few weeks ago. They, they looked at this issue of employability as they, they do frequently. As they said about digital, maybe two decades ago, that soon every job will be a digital job. Very soon, given what's going to happen in the world, every job will have a green dimension to it and employers will be looking for green skills. And I, I don't have time to go into all the details of that, what that is, but an appreciation of the issues because you know, trade, commerce, manufacturing, society, food, all of these issues that are major industrial sectors will have to adjust <coughs> to, you know, it's climate adaptation, but all of the factors affecting uh, future society. So green skills, one will hear more and more about in terms of uh, preparing, one of the things 
important for universities, preparing students not just for employment but for society in general. And uh, <coughs> just a small plug for us actually, but on University World News we have a, an entire section devoted to higher education's contribution to the SDGs and many of these different examples come up in yes. there and we, we really would like to hear from people about the good work that's being done so that we can, we can share that with everyone else. I'd, but I'd highly recommend, and I'm not, this is not a paid advert, <laughs> <laughs> SDG Hub on the University World News. It, I found it very useful in terms of recent years, in terms of, again, getting a sense, and, and you, you cover the globe, which I think is interesting, and look at the issues, and as I say, they're very different in different parts of the world, and some, as the audience would know, island nations now have their very existence challenged and threatened and, and if you follow that forward for higher education one of the big issues that is going to come up is is uh, climate refugees which is going to be in the hundreds of millions right Huge. it's yeah. going to be absolutely massive so how is how is society going to adapt to that how is higher education going to adapt to that so yeah that's but a big SDG hub yes. it's a big <laughs> issue but I think I think one of the things that does come from all the stories on the hub is just that actually <clears throat> these challenges are challenging higher education itself yes to be reformed, correct. to be yeah. transdisciplinary, yeah. to be much yeah. more cognizant of the complex interrelationship between uh, different challenges in society and to try and address them. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone would have, would have believed how agile higher education was during COVID. You know, no one would have predicted that. If that was a kind of a, a strategy experiment that was, that was being planned, it probably would have taken two or three decades to do what happened. But the system everywhere across the globe certainly I'd be very familiar in this part of the world, stood up and changed and adapted ex at extreme speed. And I think um, lessons learned from that can be applied to the kind of, uh, I would say, the mission change, the mission drive that has to happen for universities if they are to take a leadership role globally in, in the challenges, the existential challenges that are facing society. Well, thank you very much. We've run out of time, but it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, thank, thank you for your time. Thanks, Brendan.